wait for us. God of righteous judgment, you surprise us with your grace to take our hearts and mend them with
voices one last time. People's Church, Pastor Jeff the Beardless here with you on this Independence Day. Sorry, had to shave the beard, got a lot of stuff going on in reference to coronavirus, had to be able to adequately wear my mask. So, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, it will be back. But happy 4th of July to each of you. I pray that each of you are safe and healthy and staying focused on the one thing, the one person who makes sense in all these crazy times jesus christ the king of all kings and the lord of all lords you know all across these united states people are getting to see the demonic agenda of satan exposed i mean can i ask you are are any of you happy with what you've seen in our country since the end of may i know that i'm not particularly thrilled with a lot of it but i am grateful for what is going on because Despite the mainstream media's efforts to cover up the demonic agenda in our country, people are seeing the truth, the, the false agenda and empty promises of rebellion are being exposed. Most people I know are gagging on the violence and the anarchy and the reckless indifference and despise for authority that's going on. You know, if you want to see the real agenda of Satan, just look at the revolt everywhere that is trying to sell this narrative of freedom and uh, being informed and a throwing off of the oppression and a liberation of the soul, you know. And then take a look at downtown Seattle, where the oppression of the local government and the police were successfully thrown off. And in less than two weeks, in a six square block area, that eventually got reduced to three square blocks of city. You had five shootings, two of them fatal, a rape, multiple instances of property damage and assault. In, in one of the articles I was reading, 
some of the residents were quoted as saying that since the occupation of that area, the streets surrounding their building that they were living in, the tenants there had, had were subjected to violence, uh, threats, vandalism, noise, lewd conduct, public defecation, uh, daily fights in the street, and, and difficulty accessing their own building. Uh, the chief of police, when they took it back, I mean, she was stunned by, the, by just the amount of graffiti and the garbage and the property destruction that had taken place in that area. I mean, you don't say, right? Can we be surprised by this? All of this area was affectionately run by a man who referred to himself as a warlord. Doesn't that just sound like a terrific, fantastic utopia that we would sign up for? Isn't that great? No, it's not great. The only thing great about it is it's the great bait and switch by the oppressor, by the enemy, by the snake, by the deceiver, the devil. The bad part about deception is it's deceiving. You've heard me say that before. But listen, enough of that stuff. I hope that you are well. I hope that you are safe. I hope that you're keeping your lives in Jesus. I thank you very much, all of you, for your prayers for me and for my facility and the detainees and the staff. This has probably been one of the hardest weeks that I've ever had in my career. I've had a few weeks of tremendous pressure and, and just terrible news and strong attacks and, and very difficult decisions that weren't always pleasant. And I'm not the only one. A lot of my staff are enduring this with me, so please pray for Rebecca and Matt and several of the people of our church that work as staff at the facility. We are all in need of God's supernatural protection. Um, I got to tell you, if it wasn't for God, I don't know how I would be doing. So I'm thankful to him for his sustaining grace through all of this. It's the only thing that has made a difference. Uh, I could have been absolutely crushed by the circumstances that I'm in right now if it were not for the Lord. And uh, I have tangibly uh, felt the weight of these days, and, and I've had some moments where where I've been like, oh, okay, God, that's that's it. I can't, I can't take any more today. I've reached my limit. You've got to help me. And you know what? He has. Uh, just a couple nights ago, I was having one of those moments, and I was just beat down and exhausted, and, and I got home, and the, the Lord told me to put on some worship music because he wanted to minister to me. And uh, my response wasn't the greatest. I was like, you know, Lord, I, I'm really not in the mood to be ministered to right now. You know, sometimes you just feel that way. <laughs> and uh, he didn't really care much for my opinion. He told me to do it anyway, so so I did what I was asked, and I put on some worship music, and and uh, and, and man, was I refreshed by the Spirit of God. I mean, the Holy Spirit just settled on me, and uh, I began to worship in the natural and in the spirit, and all of that burden, all of that weight just broke off of me and was lifted and carried away, and uh, I was very full of joy afterwards that, it, I mean, it's even continued several days after, right? So God is so good to us, even when we don't feel like it, we need to give him glory and worship him for who he is. And uh, and I'm grateful that in these last few weeks, I've, I've not had to deal with some of the attacks that you can typically get from the enemy in times like this. You know, from time to time, you're going through difficult situations and the enemy likes to come in and tell you that the reason you're going through these things is because God is displeased with you or because he's mad at you or because he's judging you for sin in your life or, you know, that, that whole, that whole line of, of thinking, you know, that's the devil's MO, right? But, uh, thankfully I haven't had to deal with that. Uh, I'm not, uh, at the same time, I'm not under any illusion that just because I walk with God and just because I'm his servant that I'm somehow exempt from trial and tribulation because I'm not. I'm recognizing this situation for what it is. You know, it's a forging process. It's a refining process. You know, the only real downside to it all is that I know the Lord is allowing this to happen around me so that I can be broken down, so that I can be reinforced and built back up 
so that I'm ready for more adversity and more challenges and more difficulty the next time around. So, you know, when, <laughs> when, when the next problem comes, I'll be able to, my resolve will still say, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be his name. You know, God alone is good and he's worthy of all praise and glory and honor. And all of my days, I want his voice, I want my voice to be able to sing his praises. And so I thank, I thank you, God, for your grace and for your wisdom and for your mercy and favor towards me and my staff and your protection of all of us. And uh, your name is glorious. I bless your name. I bless your name. Okay, let's, um, let's get to this week's study. This time, I promise it's going to be shorter. I mean, it's the 4th of July. Nobody's probably even watching this right now, which is fine. <laughs> They'll catch up, I'm sure. Uh, but last week, we discussed the mixed company of people that left Egypt as Israel. We talked about the things that we found in the law in reference to the foreigner and the sojourners and, and the Passover meal. We examined God's instruction to Israel about warfare with the nations that they were to conquer and the difference between those that God told to utterly destroy and those that he told them to offer peace to initially. And we pointed out that the main difference between those two groups of people was the peoples of Canaan were designated to be destroyed, that it was for theological reasons and not ethnic or racial reasons. And lastly, we finished up by looking at the story of Moses and his marriage to a Cushite woman, which from all the evidence we have uh, would very much indicate that Moses married a black African woman. Uh, from this, we saw this was a period of Moses's life where he was walking closely with the Lord, uh, communicating with God uh, in ways in which no one else in Scripture is, is described as, as having. And uh, we can safely infer that God was approving of this marriage because of his relationship with Moses at that time. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue to examine uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament um, during their times in the wilderness and, and their initial entry into the Promised Land. That's the only part I'm going to cover. Uh, let's start with the Bible to give some context to where we're beginning. I'm going to be reading to, uh, from Numbers 25. This is just after the situation with Balaam when Israel is in Moab. But I'm going to be starting in Numbers 25, verse 1, if you want to read along with me. If you got your Bibles, here we go. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Aren't you glad we can just ask for forgiveness nowadays? So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to the Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel and those who died in the plague were 24,000. In 1990, a man named Richard Kelly Hoskins wrote a book called Vigilantes of Christendom, the story of the Phineas Priesthood. To be fair, I have not read this book and I do not know the author. 
From what I have read by others who have read the book, Mr. Hoskins is an avowed white supremacist. He uses the story of Phineas from Numbers 25 to describe an ideology of a Phineas priesthood that is comprised of individuals who, through the ages of history, have felt called upon by God to murder what he considers race mixers and their fellow partners. He reads this story from Scripture as saying that God had decreed the death penalty for anyone that mixes race. From what I've read, the modern day uh, Phineas Priesthood is not really an organized group, but it's rather just this crazy, evil, perverted ideology based on what happened in this scripture. There uh, have since been a handful of hate crimes committed by people that have read this book and are apparently following the philosophy. You remember when I said a few minutes ago, the bad part about deception is that it's deceiving. Well, from what I've just told you, and from what I'm about to tell you, we're going to illustrate the meaning of that statement to a T. So here we go. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about Phinehas the priest and why his story is important to our biblical worldview of race. Now, most people, when you mention Phinehas uh, in Scripture, they think of Phinehas and Hophni, Eli the prophet's wicked sons. Uh, this Phinehas is not the same Phinehas as Eli's son. There's actually three different Phinehases in the Old Testament. You have the one that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, Eliezer's son, the, the grandson of Aaron. Uh, the next the next Phinehas you have in Scripture is Eli's son. And then the last Phinehas was a priest after the exile from Babylon was over. He was Eliezer's father. So this first one, Eliezer is the father and Phinehas is the son. In the last one, Phinehas is the father and Eliezer is the son. So this Phinehas is Aaron's grandson. And we just read what he did. And we kind of touched on who the Midians were last week, all right? We talked about they, they were one of these groups that here God told Israel to wipe out, but why? Uh, they were not one of the residents of, of the land of Canaan that was on God's list of people that needed to be eliminated. The land of Canaan, uh, or I'm sorry, the land of Midian was actually south of Canaan. Uh, they, were, they were neighbors of Moab. In fact, they were the ones who joined with Moab in trying to get Balaam to curse Israel in Numbers uh, 23 and 24. Um, they probably would have been safe in this instance if they hadn't done to Israel what they did, but they ensnared Israel by enticing them to worship other gods, Baal specifically, and they did it through the use of their women and sexual seduction. So here we are, Numbers 25, Israel is still in Moab. And exactly what God had warned would happen to Israel if they didn't keep it in the road happens. And in the very midst of God pronouncing judgment, you know, his leaders are at the tent of meeting hearing the judgment. Here comes this Israelite bouncing through the camp with his new Midianite woman. And uh, Phinehas is, is sitting with the leaders and he sees this and he's consumed with zeal for the Lord and he dispatches the situation, as it were. So who is this guy, Phinehas? Uh, the first time we see him is in Exodus chapter 6. We'll read Exodus chapter 6, verse 25. It says, Eliezer, Aaron's son, took for himself one of the daughters of Putil as wife, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites, according to their families. So that verse in Exodus 6, that's the end of the priestly genealogy, uh, starting with Levi and going all the way down to Phinehas. Uh, Aaron's son, Eliezer, marries a daughter of Putiel, and she gives birth to Phinehas. So Phinehas is also the great nephew of Moses, but the Bible emphasizes his priestly line from Levi and Aaron. 
What's more interesting is the priestly genealogy there in Exodus chapter 6. It ends with Phineas or culminates with Phineas. He's the last one in that line to be mentioned. The next time we see his name is here in Numbers 25, which we just read. Uh, Israel's committing apostasy, worshiping other gods, fornicating with Midianite women. Uh, so it's story's kind of confusing. You know, a plague starts in the camp, but that's not really mentioned until Phineas kills this Israelite and the Midianite woman, and then the plague stops. But by the time the plague started and stopped, 24,000 Israelites had died. Uh, you know, what kind of a plague kills you instantly? Just a question. So let's continue reading on there and see what God's reaction was to this situation with Phineas. Because Phineas wasn't told to do what he did, but he did it. So picking up in verse 10, let's see what the Lord had to say about it. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty cool reward from God, if you ask me. A covenant of an everlasting priesthood and a covenant of peace with God. I'll, I'll take that, please. Uh, the next time we see Phinehas, he's leading a military battle in uh, Numbers chapter 31. That is, the purpose of that campaign is to completely wipe out the Midianites. Uh, he also appears in the book of Joshua in the 22nd chapter. If you remember, Joshua 22 is the story of when the tribe of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned to their territory on the other side of the Jordan after all the wars. And they end up building an altar to the Lord. But there is someone who's stirring up some garbage and gossiping, and this person tells the rest of the tribes of Israel that these three tribes, or two and a half tribes, are building, are building an unauthorized altar. So here comes Phinehas, and he's bringing ten of the leaders of Israel with him. And if what he's been hearing is true, somebody else is fixing to get speared. But thankfully, uh, when they arrive, these tribes, uh, these three, two and a half tribes, they say to him, hey, we're, we're not trying to build an altar for any other reason than for the generations that are to come after us. In case somewhere down the line people forget that we're a part and they try and tell us that we've never had a part in the Lord, we can point over to the altar and say, hey, that's not true. We've been with the Lord since the beginning. So, so Phinehas is, is satisfied with that, with what he hears, and he's able to stop what would have been a civil war among the Israelites at that time. It's interesting that in the book of Joshua, you know, that, that whole book is focused on Joshua's le uh, leadership. But Phinehas is the only other leader who's mentioned in the book of Joshua that is ever doing anything with the people of God, taking an initiative to, to lead them in something. Phinehas is also seen during civil war with Benjamin in, in Judges chapter 20. In Judges chapter 19, the Benjamites do a very wicked thing. It's a very, very similar story to, to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You have this Levite who's traveling home. He stops in a Benjamite town named Gibeah. He's got his concubine with him. He goes to spend, his, spend the night. At night, the men of the city come out. They want to sexually assault him. And he, they get his concubine instead. And they end up raping her and abusing her all night until the point that she dies. And the Levite comes out in the morning and he takes his concubine home and he cuts her up in pieces and he sends her to the tribe of Israel, and he basically cries out for justice for this. And then Israel comes out for war, and then they're led by Phinehas. And it's Phinehas who, who brings the, the army of Israel down to the nation of Benjamin and asks the Lord if he should go up to battle against his own people, uh, the Benjamites, for their wickedness. And the Lord says, yes, go up and I will deliver them into your hand. 
Phinehas is also mentioned in the genealogies in 1 Chronicles. If I remember right, he's mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter uh, 6, and then I think again in either chapter 9 or chapter 10. In chapter 9 or chapter 10, the Bible specifically says that God was with him and that he was, I think, a, a keeper of the, of the gate of the camp or of, the, of the, the gate of the temple. He was over the group of gatekeepers. I'm pretty sure it was the tabernacle. Um, but Phinehas, through these stories, emerges as a pretty important guy. And the Bible speaks favorably of him in all these accounts. And one of the last places we see him is Psalm 106. So if you want to turn with me to Psalm 106, we'll read about him here. Um, this is a long psalm, but we're going to pick up in verse 19. I guess that's as good a place to start as any. Psalm 106, verse 19, They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molded image. Thus they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. But they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he raised up his hand in an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their descendants among the nations and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves also to Baal of Peor. Same thing we just read about in Numbers 25 and ate sacrifices made to the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stopped. And that was accounted to him for righteousness to all the generations forevermore. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses on account of them, because they rebelled against his spirit, so that he spoke rashly with his lips. So here in this psalm, we have these recountings of Israel's less than stellar moments. And you have about 43 verses here of all their mistakes. But the psalm is, is basically closed out by saying how God forgave them anyway, because of his covenant with them, and the fact that he loved him and they were his children. I mean... Come on, Jesus. Uh, but Phinehas and Moses are the only two people in this psalm mentioned by name. And I think that's a pretty big deal to be mentioned uh, alongside Moses, especially given the context of what's going on. So let's look, let's go back to Numbers 25. Or I'm sorry, no, let's let's go back to, to uh, verse 28 and look at what God says about him. In this verse, it says, They joined themselves also to Baal of Peor, and ate sacrifices made to the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stopped. And that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. That last verse is pretty profound. I know all people's people know their Bibles. There's only one other place where that phrase is found uh, that it was accounted to him for righteousness that is used in the Old Testament. Um, it's back in Genesis. Genesis 15, verse 6. It says, um, talking about Abraham, and Abraham believed God, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. So now, you only have two people in Scripture that the Lord says this about. Abraham, the father of the faith, and Phinehas, the priest. This phrase, as we know, also becomes a foundational theological pillar of Paul's theology in Galatians chapter 3. You turn to Galatians uh, 
It's in down in verse 6 of the third chapter. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So that scripture is what Paul used to prove his point that the Gentiles are justified by faith and accepted into the family of God just as much as the Jews are. So it's quite interesting that in the Psalms, that phrase would also be ascribed to Phineas. It's obvious to me that Phineas was highly esteemed by the Lord, and it looks like he was very deserving of that. He was loyal to the Lord. He honored the Lord with his life. There's no account in Scripture at all of him messing up or committing any sin. I mean, from all accounts, Phinehas is another biblical hero and a good example for the rest of us. So that brings us then, obviously, to the question, right? He was a great guy, but what, is, what on earth does he have to do with our study of the biblical theology of race? Well, some of you may have figured it out by now. For those that haven't, we'll explain. As we've discussed for several weeks, Cush was the country south of Egypt along the Nile River, uh, what is modern-day Sudan. I've mentioned several times over the previous weeks the role that Cush had in Egypt and among the Egyptians and the ancient Near East. Well, Phinehas the priest has everything to do with this relationship between Israel and Cush. And to look at that, we're going to begin with his name. The name Phinehas is a borrowed name from the Egyptian language. In Hebrew, his name would have been pronounced Pinhas. But his name is not Hebrew. His name is Egyptian. The Egyptians called Cush by its name Cush, but they called Cushites Nasho. In Egypt, in Egyptian, the letters PH function as an article in that language. So Phinehas's name in Egyptian is really the Nasho. In English, Phinehas means the Negro, the dark skinned one, the Nubian or the Cushite. In other words, one of the black people from the land of Cush. Now, six different scholars confirm that the name Phinehas was a common name in the Egyptian kingdoms, and that in every instance, it means a person with unusually dark skin, unusually dark skin, or a true African. My brothers and sisters, there is an extremely high degree of probability that Phinehas the priest was a black man. Here's how we get to that conclusion. High probability he was of Egyptian descent, possibly Cushite descent. And this is important. Think about it in the big picture. Phinehas has a name that means the Negro in Egyptian. It's also an explicit reference in Egyptian to people who are from the region of Cush. We know his uh, mother was a daughter of Putil. Putil is also an Egyptian name. We know the Cushites were dramatically intermingled with Egyptian culture. We've been talking about that for weeks. We also established last week that there is a great amount of evidence to suggest that Cushites would have been among the people of Israel, the mixed company of Israel that came up out of slavery. Phinehas's great uncle Mo marries a Cushite woman. Now, can we say for certain that Phinehas was black. No, we can't, and that's fair. But in order to not say that, we would have to explain away an awful lot of factors. The biggest one for me being his name. This was a time in history when naming things, especially children, really meant something. Read the Old Testament. They always talk about why they named their kid this or that. 
So if Phineas is not black and he doesn't look black, why would he be given a name that means the Negro or the dark-skinned one? For me, I'm going with the idea that he was black. The evidence is just too compelling. And not only that, there's virtually no evidence that would point us in any other direction whatsoever. I mean, he's the son of Eliezer, Aaron's son. So there's a possibility that he could be half black. But again, he was, he was given a name that means the Negro. Theologically, what's the implication? What does this do? What does this have to do with our, our biblical theology of race? Well, you have Yahweh, the Lord, who makes an eternal covenant with Phinehas, an eternal covenant of peace, the promise of an everlasting priesthood on his family line. Phinehas is then put forth as the model of what it means to be pious and zealous for the Lord. He is known for this strong and sometimes violent defense of God. Phinehas leads the army of the Lord into battle and leads as a priest over the nation. I mean, he was a military man and a warrior of God and a priest, and God accredits his actions to him as righteousness, the same as Abraham. That makes Phinehas a huge man of significance from a biblical theological perspective. Imagine what would have happened, where biblical theology would have gone, if the biblical translators of history would have understood this information 500 years ago and what implications that would have had on biblical theology coming to us in the present day. God would have made an eternal covenant of priesthood and peace with a black man. God would have accredited righteousness to a black man. The church would have never been able to sustain any kind of argument that the Bible somehow sanctions racism or slavery or is against interracial marriage. When you take all of these factors, Phinehas, Moses and his Cushite wife, the mixed company of people leaving Egypt, the history of the region in relation to Cush. It all points to the fact that Israel was very much indeed a multi-ethnic, diverse company of people that were all called the people of God. And so much for that white supremacist theory about the Phineas priesthood, right? I mean, we'll remember what I said at the beginning about the bad part about deception and is this deceiving? I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. You're, you're a whacked out white supremacist and, and you subscribe to this perverted and ignorant view of the world. And in particular, based on, on this guy you've, you've read about, whose name Finney has, that you think is white and he's involved in the killing of an interracial couple. When in reality, from what we can reasonably tell with a high degree of probability, this guy was a black guy. So, I mean... I, I, <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious. It's sad, too, you know. I mean, this is exactly what the devil does. He sells these imaginary, twisted fantasies and ideologies to people. They drink it down like Kool-Aid. They don't even know any better. Uh, next thing you know, they're out doing, you know, believing that there's some sort of white race hero committing righting wrongs in the name of a guy named Phineas that they think is this white hero of the Bible, when it actually... They're, they're just committing crimes and violence in the name of a historically black person. I mean, the irony is, is ridiculous. But anyway, that's what I got for this week. I know I went a little longer than expected, but I'm still about 10 minutes shorter. So I did live up to my promise. Um, that's that's the, the, the end for what we're going to examine this week. Listen, I hope that you guys have a great Independence Day weekend. I hope you have as good a time as you possibly can. Uh, be blessed. Stay under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty. And uh, until next week, have a good weekend.